Okay, let's pick back up in chapter 2, verse 12. Here we go. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. When you pick up the Bible and read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, you are step, keep in mind, you are stepping into a flow of thought. Do not forget what Paul just said said in verse 11, that jaw-dropping, explosive bombshell of a statement. Paul just said, Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Or put another way to first century ears, Jesus the Messiah is Yahweh. Or in today's language, Jesus, the King of Israel and of the world is the creator of the universe in flesh and blood. Now, if you are one of the Philippians, okay, and you are at church and Timothy or whoever is up front reading the letter from Paul out loud, at that point, it's not called Philippians, it's called a letter from Paul, right? Reading out loud and you are there, I mean, and he gets to that line, Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, right now your mouth is wide open. Your, your head is reeling. I imagine a long, awkward silence in the church. Jesus Christ is Lord. And then the reader goes on to say, therefore, it's the next thing out of Paul's mouth, therefore in English, or hoste in Greek. And it's a different word from um, what gets translated as therefore all over Philippians. Hoste means as a result. As a result of what? As a result of the reality that Jesus Christ is is Lord. Here's what should happen in your life, right? Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, is the creator of the universe. What does that mean? Well, that means, and Paul lays out a command, and uh, there's only one and only command right in the paragraph, right in the middle of the paragraph in the text. Paul says, and I quote, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, um, before we get into that command, and I forewarn you, it's a can of worms, right? It's loaded for obvious reasons. You need to understand that Paul sets up the command by saying two things. First off, Paul says, my dear, look down at your Bibles, therefore, my dear what? My dear friends. Now, um, the majority of the time, Paul calls the Philippians his Adelphos, or my brothers and sisters. But right here, Paul calls the Philippians his agapetos, or my dear friends. It's from the Greek word agape. Literally, it means my agape ones or my loved ones. It's a term of endearment. Paul says, listen, I love you in, in the way a you know, father loves a child and or a brother loves a sister, and I like you in the way you like a friend or, or a buddy. There is a deep bond. Um, Paul is separated from the Philippians from, by upwards of a thousand miles but there is a deep bond between the apostle and the church. In the beginning of the letter, Paul says um, in chapter one, verse eight, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Remember how that word affection is splagnon in the Greek? And it means intestines. Paul says, I love you with my splagnon. <laughs> and I love you with my intestines. I love you deep in my gut. I feel agape or, or love for you. And then at the end of the letter, Paul says, my brothers and sisters whom I agape or love and long for my joy and crown. I mean, Paul is up to his eyeballs in friendship. There is a deep, authentic agape love in Paul's heart for the Philippians. I get, that way. I get that because it's the exact same way I feel about you, right? I love you, you are my family, and I like you, you're my friends. I like to do life with you. I, I, I love to listen to you singing on that last song. Gosh, you sound beautiful. A few of you don't, but overall, <laughs> right? Well, the people I was sitting by, you sound, be I mean, I like you. I like to hang out with you. I'm friends with you. Right? I, 
I, I get that, and Paul. Now, now the question is, why does Paul feel this agape or this love, this kind of love for the Philippians, right? He never calls um, the Colossians or the Galatians or the Corinthians his agapetos. Like the one and only other church he calls my agapetos or my loved ones is the Thessalonians. They're 14 letters to 14 churches in the New Testament, two get called, hey, my agapetos or my loved ones. Now, what is so special about the Philippians? Why does Paul feel this agape or feel this love for the church in Philippi? Well, Paul goes on and he says, and here's how he sets up the command. My dear friends, second, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Paul switches metaphors from um, brothers and sisters to parent and child and says, listen, when I was with you, when I was in person, I was in Philippi on the ground a few years back, you were brand new to Jesus, you were young, you were infants in the faith, right? And you obeyed. Chris, do you want me to switch my mic out? Yes. Would you guys like me to switch out my mic? I know that is, Ben, would you like to run up here as fast as you can? Ladies and, yeah, this is Ben Peterson. He just got married, how about that? And are we on? How's married life? Don't answer that question. Um, <laughs> never ask a man that two weeks after his wedding. All right. All right, here we go. Much better. Is that okay? All right, what was I saying? Um, I got petos. Uh, oh, yeah, parent, child. Okay. Immaturity right here. Okay, here we go. As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, now much more in my absence. Okay, so as you obey, when I was with you, you were young, you were brand new, you were infants in the faith. Now, I'm long gone. It's been years. I'm hundreds of miles away in Rome, in prison, and you are all grown up. You're moved out of the house, and you're still obeying. That is what every parent dreams of for his child. Am I right? Right? I mean, you, you moms and dads, you know that full well. Your dream for your child is to grow up and to obey when you are no longer there to enforce the rules. Am I right? There's a line in the Hebrew wisdom literature that says, start, off, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Right? The goal of parenting is just that, to start children off, to set the trajectory. Here's how you live. Here are the commands to obey. And you hope and you pray on that day when you release the child. If it's a boy, when he turns 18. If it's a girl, 42. When you release... <laughs> When you release the child out into the world, the, the ho you hope, <laughs> what are you laughing at? You think that was a joke. Um, when you release the child out, you hope and pray he or she stays on the road, on the straight and narrow when you are no longer there to enforce the rules. You know, I'll never forget growing up, I was raised in a dysfunctional home, um, to say the least. <laughs> Um, but I was raised, amazing father, amazing mother, um, all that. And my parents, I, but I was raised, not but, period. And I, I was raised in a very conservative home. My dad was saved out of the 1960s music scene, enough said. And <laughs> let's just say the pendulum swings, okay? <laughs> in particular, in the area of entertainment. I mean, for years, I, I actually thought that PG was a moniker for pure garbage, right? <laughs> And my parents were really strict. By the grace of God, Star Wars got through, as did The Princess Bride. But um, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> there was not much love in the Comer house, all right? But I will never forget, when, when I was 10 years old, uh, in 1990, I was in fifth grade, and um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> hit movie theaters. How many of you were there, right? Yeah, you feel the 10 feels the love. The eight stared at me with, with odd eyes, but the 10 feels the love. And um, I was not allowed to watch Teenage. I don't know if it was April. I don't know if it was, I don't know what's horrific about pizza and turtles, but I was not allowed. Now that's a problem because I'm in fifth grade. The number one word on the playground in fifth grade was cowabunga, right? 
And I would keep saying that. I have no idea what this means, but cowabunga, what does this mean, right? And we would act stuff out. I didn't know the parts to play. I mean, it, it was scarring, to say the least, okay? Now, fast forward to I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior in high school, okay? And I still have not seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> but my parents go away for the weekend. And for the first time, I am left alone, house to myself. I'm 17. I have a job, money in my pocket. I own a car, a 1977 Volkswagen bus. Thank you very much. That is a whole other sermon. Um, And I'm sitting there one night thinking, what should I do? And it strikes me. Mom and dad are not here. And I go down to Blockbuster Video, and I rent the Ninja Turtles. I pay cash, no trace. (laughs) I go home, and cowering in guilt and shame, I watch Donatello and April on the screen. And the next night, with all that guilt, with all that shame, I rented Secret of the Ooze, part two, right? (laughs) Now, the Philippians are not like that. There's a word for that, immaturity, right? Immaturity is when you don't know how to handle freedom. The the Philippians are not like that. Paul says, you obey when I was there to enforce the rules, and now I'm out of the way, and you are still obeying. I love that about you. I I feel love for you in my splagnon because of that. Now then, Paul says, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, then Paul goes on and, and lays out the command to, and I quote, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now let's pull that apart one phrase at a time. First off, Paul says continue, right? In Greek, it's in the present progressive, meaning don't stop, right? Don't stop working out your salvation. Keep up, keep going. To continue is ongoing, unflagging, implacable obedience what Eugene Peterson called a long obedience in the same direction. I read this morning in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, never get tired of doing what is good. How many of you get tired? How many of you get worn down? How many of you get bored of doing what is good day in, day out? Paul says, don't stop continue, and then he says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, keep in mind, he just said, as you have always obeyed, continue, and if you're there and you're listening to Philippians read out loud, your ear, you you would think your ear is waiting for Paul to say continue to obey. You've always obeyed, now in my absence, continue to obey, right? Makes sense. But Paul mixes it up a bit, and in place of the word obey, Paul puts the phrase, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, whatever that means, it's a synonym to obey. Continue to obey, or, and here's what I mean by that, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, to work out is a phrase that can be translated to go at it with energy, with drive, with intensity. I mean, to get up and get ready to go and chase down and and drive after work out, continue, don't stop, to work out. And then Paul says your salvation. Now, um, what does Paul mean by salvation? I mean, so many people freak out right here. Is Paul saying, you know, you earn your salvation? Is Paul down on grace? Is Paul saying you earn, and if you work hard enough, you earn? And one of the many reasons so many people freak out is because to many people, salvation is a flat, truncated, one-dimensional word, right? To many people, it means getting out of hell and into heaven when you die, period, end of story. And there's truth in that, absolutely. I believe all that. Um, But to Paul, it's a wide, elastic, panoramic word. And it's not just about you. It's about all of creation. It's not just about the past. It's about the future and the present. Paul uses the word salvation in the past, present, and future tense. Paul says, listen, you were saved in the past. There was a moment in time when you, in Paul's language, passed from death to life where you were an enemy of God, you were an object of the creator's wrath, you were far from God, separated, no spirit of God in your life, and then through repentance, through the spirit of God, pulling you closer and closer, pulling you through repentance and faith, you stepped into the waters of baptism, and you were 
a brand new creation. You passed into the kingdom of God. Now you are adopted into God's family. You are no longer an enemy. You are a son or a daughter, no longer an object of wrath. You are an object of mercy. You were saved in the past. And Paul uses that language all the time in the present tense. Right now, as you speak, um, you are being saved. You're a work in progress. Would you agree with that? If you're married, I'm sure your spouse would, right? I hope he's a work in progress, right? You, you are. You are not done yet. You are incomplete. You are partial. You're halfway there. You are being saved. And Paul uses that language in the future tense. You will be saved. In fact, the majority of the time, I think, from what I understand, the majority of the time, Paul uses salvation or soteria in Greek in the future tense. As yet future, on the horizon, there is a coming a day when you, and not only you, but the whole creation is put back together where God, what God is right now doing in bits and pieces in your soul, in your mind, in your relationship, where it spreads out to all of your being, to your body and resurrection from there to the whole universe salvation on the horizon in the future you are saved you're being saved you will be saved it's kind of like a marriage right i was married and i am married by the grace of god and i hope and pray i will be married right there was a moment in time right june 16th 2000 and i think one um <laughs> should know that uh there was a moment in time when I said, I do, and by the grace of God, my wife said the exact same thing back, and I was married. But I am going to spend the rest of my life living up to what is already true of me. I'm already a husband. I'm already married. I'm not earning that per se, but I'm living up to that. Every day is an opportunity to grow as a husband, to work out my husbanding or whatever, right? With fear and trembling. <laughs> Every day is an opportunity to live up to what's already true of me. I'm already married. Every day is an open door to live up. In the exact same way, Paul says, listen, you're already saved. And now every day you get an opportunity to live up to what's already true of you, to work out your salvation. And then Paul goes on and says, with fear and trembling. Now that's one of those lines that if you're anything like me, you, you skip over when you are reading the Bible. I don't really want to know what that means. I just hope it doesn't mean what it sounds like it means, right? Um, it's a phrase, fear and trembling, used all over what you and I call the Old Testament, what Paul called the scriptures, that speaks of when a man or a woman encounters the presence of the living God. I think of the prophet in Isaiah 6 in Jerusalem in the temple, gets a vision of God, and the first words out of Isaiah's mouth are, woe is me, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, my eyes have seen the king. I think of John at the end of the Bible in Revelation 1, he is on the island of Patmos, and he gets a vision of Jesus back from the dead, risen, exalted to the right hand of God, so to speak. And the first thing John says in Revelation 1 is, I fell at his feet as though dead. And Jesus put his hand on John's shoulder and said, John, do not be, anybody know? Afraid. Why? Because John was scared to death. In my opinion, we have lost something of fear and trembling. We have slipped to a, right on the edge of a flippant and irreverent theology of God. I mean, did you know that over a hundred times the Old Testament talks about the fear of Yahweh or the fear of the Lord? Did you know there are 36 commands in the Torah to fear God? 36 times, God commands you and me to fear God. Wait a minute, I thought fear was a bad thing. Well, not always. The problem is not that we fear, it's that we fear all the wrong things, right? We fear money or unemployment or cancer or sickness or death. God says, listen, fear me, and then you will have nothing else to fear, but fear me. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard people explain that word away and say, you know, it doesn't really mean fear. It means reverence and respect. That's funny because it says fear. 
you know? I'm no scholar, but I am well aware there are words in Hebrew and Greek that mean reverence and respect. That's not one of them. In Greek, fear means fear. Now, I don't think it means fear in the sense of cowering in the corner, scared to death of God with a lightning bolt ready to zap you if you screw up, right? But let's be honest, that's 1% of you who feel that way about God. I mean, when I think of fear, I think of my dad growing up, <laughs> right? I mean, I was well aware that my father loved me. There's no doubt in my mind, amazing father. And I was well aware that when I disobeyed, I was scared to death, <laughs> right? There, and it was, it was well-placed fear. <laughs> I mean, the worst words, when mom said, oh, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> Oh, no, there goes the rest of my day, right? The dark cloud hangs over you. There goes the neighborhood, okay, right? But um, fear and love are not mutually exclusive. You can enjoy the love of your father and at the same time be scared to death of what will happen if you disobey and step outside. Not mutually exclusive. In fact, one flows from the other. I think of creation. You know, a few weeks ago, I was over in eastern Oregon with my family and out by the Ochicos. You ever been there? Um, painted hills, drop dead gorgeous, right? And we go on a hike up at the top of a mountain and there's a cliff right on the edge and it is, I mean, mind-numbing in beauty, right? But it's really dangerous. I'm there with my three kids. And, um, you know, I will never forget, you're right on the edge of the cliff and it, it's weird because on one hand, you're scared to death because you're well aware one wrong step, it's way out in the middle of nowhere, no guardrails, none of that. One wrong step, you're dead, right? One wrong step, it's over. But at the same time, there's nowhere you would rather be because you are in the presence of raw, uncut beauty. That is the creation. Can you imagine standing in front of the creator? Paul says, listen, one day you will. One day you will stand in the presence of the living God. Right? There's a spot in Paul's letter to the Corinthians who are kind of off track, and, and Paul says, listen, you will all stand before God and answer for the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. Another one of the verses we don't like to talk about. Wait, me? But I thought I'm saved. Absolutely. I thought God is my father. Absolutely. And when you disobey... You will stand in the presence of the living God in fear. And in, in the meantime, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that line all by itself is a can of worms, right? Work out your salvation. Paul just said work out, and then Paul just said salvation. Uh-oh, red lights on dashboard go off, right? And then you add on the tagline with fear and trembling. Holy cow, it's, it's a tightrope, right? I mean, you are, I mean, you fall on, it's really easy to misinterpret. I mean, you fall on one side or the other and you are in trouble, which means before we move on, let's clarify both sides, all right? Next slide. On one hand, the text says work out your salvation. Make sure you write that down. Not work for your salvation. Right? He's not saying you earn your salvation. Keep in mind, he's writing to people who are already saved. First words out of Paul's mouth, chapter one, verse one, to all God's holy people in King Jesus at Philippi. Right? To people who are already saved, he says, hey, work out your own salvation. Not saying, to clarify, not saying you earn, in any sense of the word, your salvation. But, but, on the other hand, he says, work out your salvation, right? The text does say work, and work means work, right? Labor, sweat. In fact, go at it with energy, Paul says. Flesh out your salvation, carry out your salvation, get to work. Now, now to clarify, I mean, we, we live, you need to understand where you live in history, right? You live 2012, Portland, you live um, a few hundred years after a thing called the Protestant Reformation. If you don't know about that, Wikipedia. Um, and for the last three or 400 years, there has been a global and historic 
in my opinion, overreaction to the broken pieces of Catholic theology. And a bunch of the reaction was spot on and well-deserved, but, but a bunch was not. The pendulum swings, right? You all know how that works. And you live at a moment in time when there is a hypersensitivity slash paranoia of good works in the church, at least outside of Catholicism, right? I mean, people are paranoid by scared to death of, you know, are you, are you saying I earned my salvation? Is Paul saying scared to death of good works? The problem is Paul and the biblical authors do not share that paranoia, right? At all. Um, I think of the well-known verse we all love to quote, for it is by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Uh, next slide. But nobody quotes where that actually comes from. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He says that through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Now, is that the end of the paragraph? Yes or no? No, absolutely not. Paul goes on, flows right into, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do not disconnect the second half of that paragraph from the first. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith. Absolutely not by works, but you are saved for good works. And the moment you quote one side of that equation without the other, you are off balance and you err on one side. Never do that. Never quote one without the other. We quote the first half all the time. I almost never hear people talk about the second half. You are saved for, you are created for good works. You all know the line in James, right? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. If your faith is not backed up by uh, deeds and, and works, um, in Greek are one and the same word, good deeds, good works, tomato, tomato, right? Um, if your faith is not backed up by good works, by action, by oomph, by flesh and blood, by generosity, by fruit, by labor, by hard, um, your faith is dead. Your faith is a corpse, no life. I think of the story of Jesus in Matthew 19, really jacks up my theology. Jesus does that all the time. <laughs> and he bumps into a guy on the road, young guy with a whole bunch of money, and the young guy says, um, um, <clears throat> teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, I know what Jesus is supposed to say right here. Jesus is supposed to say, do, man, you don't need to do anything. Just believe. It's by grace through faith. I'm going to the cross. You just need to believe in me on the cross. It's not by works. You don't get any credit. God gets not by, don't do anything. Does Jesus say that? Nope. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Whoa, wait, Jesus, that's not right. <laughs> I, I think he gets to write the Bible, not you, right? Next slide. Um, All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Faith, you just need to believe. Nope, if you wanna be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. What are you, I'm just quoting Jesus, people. Okay, I'm just quoting Jesus. Now, my, my point is, I, I know what Jesus is supposed to say, but he's just not scared of good works. Not Jesus, not James, not Paul. In fact, I mean, to Paul, good works are just that, good. Not bad, good. You were created to do good works. Why? Because you are the people of God. Go read your Bibles. Go read Genesis, first chapter, in the first story in the Bible. God calls Abraham, right? Who becomes the father of Israel. You are part of that family. I think if Paul were writing a systematic theology textbook, he would never separate out um, what you and I call soteriology um, which is the doctrine of salvation, how you get saved, how you get made right with God, from missiology or the mission of God, what God is up to in the world. I think to Paul, they are one and the same because in the second, in the moment you are made right, you are saved, you are made right with God, at that instant, you are made a part of the mission of God. 
One of Paul's favorite metaphors to speak of faith and the cross is that of adoption. You are adopted into God's family. God is the father, you are the sons, you are the daughters, but you need to understand that God's family is the Abraham family. God's family is called, go read Genesis 12, to be a blessing. That is the number one command, to be a blessing, to spread God's blessing, God's salvation over every corner of the earth. That is what you are saved into. What are you saying? I'm saying, welcome to the family, get to work. Right? Welcome to the people of God. You have a job to do. You are called to spread God's blessing everywhere you go. Are you doing that? I love how followers of Jesus early on in American history used to be called do-gooders. Nobody calls us that anymore. We get called Republicans now. (laughs) Wait, Wait a minute, what happened? I think we lost the plot line, right? You are called to do, are you doing that? Is that true of you? Are you a blessing to your neighborhood? Are you a blessing to your office? Are you a blessing to your children? Are you a blessing to your parents? Are you a blessing to your family? Are you a blessing to your friends? Are you a blessing to your church? Are you a blessing to me? Are you a bless- <laughs> Just saying, you know. <laughs> are you doing that? You are called to spread God's blessing. Now make sure, yes, you are saved by grace through faith, but you are saved for good works. Yes, you are adopted into God's family by the sheer scandalous grace of God, and you have a job to do. Make sure you walk that line. Now, for those of you ex-Catholics who are nervous right now, okay, keep reading. How can Paul, you're thinking, how can Paul say that? Paul just put the phrase work out right next to the word salvation. I mean, that's like putting gasoline next to a fire, right? How can Paul say that? Well, keep reading. Paul goes on. Listen to what Paul believes, okay? Listen. Paul believes, 13, for, here's how, it is God who works in you. Now, that phrase, works in you, is energon in Greek. It's where we get the word energy, Paul believes there is a divine, um, creative, spiritual energy at work in you. Think back to what Paul said in chapter one, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Remember how all of that is allusions and semi-quotes from Genesis one and two? And Paul is retelling the Genesis story and saying, listen, the creator God, the exact same creative energy, also known as the spirit of God that spoke the universe into existence is at work deep inside your being. And all you have to do All all you have to do is is plug in to that power source, right? And if you you plug in, there is power. Now, all of you Home Depot types, (laughs) my protecticals, um, all of you OSHA types, I'm sorry. Paul is not saying, when Paul, when Paul says, okay, work out your salvation with fear, kind of hipster, right? <laughs> work out your salvation with fear <laughs> and, and trembling. He, he's not saying, listen, you need to work out your salvation and get that done and, and work and it's, it's all up to you and just work your tail off and white knuckle, but I'm tired, but keep working, but keep. <sighs> he's not saying that, is he? No, what Paul is saying is, listen, you, you are a tool. You are in the hands of the creator God. And, and there is a power deep inside of you. And, and all you have to do is make sure that laser is on. <laughs> and all you have to do is tap into that power. Those of you in the front row, (laughs) welcome to church. Um, Now, I mean, that's what he's saying. I'm gonna keep these on. That's what he's saying is, listen, there is an energon. There, there, is a, there is an energy deep inside of you called the Holy Spirit, and all you have to do is tap in. 
God who works in you. And then he goes on to say, to will and to act. Now, there's a whole bunch of different ways to translate that phrase, to will and to act. Next slide. It can be translated to will and to work in the ESV or to help you want to do and be able to do or giving you the desire, I love that, and the power to do, or creating both the desire and the drive to promote. I love that language of desire. Um, Paul's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit generates in you a desire to obey. Now, in theology, it's called regeneration, and, and it, is, it is a piece of theology we do not talk about enough. Make sure you listen right now for the next few seconds. When you are saved, at that moment, you are, when you come up out of the waters in baptism, for example, at that moment, you are filled with the Spirit of God, and you are regenerated. What does that mean? That put simply in layman's, it means God puts a new heart into you. In the language of the prophet Ezekiel, God takes out the heart of flesh, and God puts in, I'm, I'm sorry, God takes out the heart of stone, and God puts in a heart of flesh, and God actually regenerates your heart. And now, as a child of God, your deepest desire is to obey. Now, your strongest desire is not always to obey, but your deepest desire is. For example, anybody have a boyfriend here, a girlfriend? Spread the love, hand up. I mean, right now, you are proud, unless if it's like on the edge and you're like, oh, oh, nope, okay, I thought. <laughs> I was, ah, no. I'm sorry, you had a boyfriend, or you thought you had, no more. Um, but, I mean, and you know that moment when you're with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and it's late at night, and you're all alone, and you know, you're being dumb, and um, <laughs> temptation is at an all-time high. In that moment, your strongest desire, I'm guessing, is not for purity, right? It's not to keep your hands in your pocket, your clothes on, and pray and read the Bible, right? Guessing your strongest desire is whatever. Never mind. That's a whole other sermon. Um, but when you're outside of that moment, when you're in sitting clothed and in your right mind, okay, your deepest. <laughs> that was. I'm going to move on from that. <laughs> your deepest desire is for purity. I mean, you, your deepest desire when you are in your right mind is is to obey. You know full well the command in 1 Thessalonians 4, this is God's will for you that you should abstain from sexual immorality. You get that. You know no questions asked. You get God's will for you. What God is after for you is for purity, for you to abstain from sexual immorality. You know Paul goes on and says you should not defraud your brother or sister. That human being it is not an object for you to steal from, but it's a brother, uh, she's a sister, and when you take away purity from him or her, you are steal it's robbery, you are stealing from his or her future joy. Paul, I mean, you know what Paul says next, that you are to honor God with your bodies, and you want that. You want to honor God with your body. It's your deepest desire. Now, if that's not true of you, either that means, A, you're not regenerated, in which case, the door is wide open. Jesus says, come in, repent of your sins, put your faith, step into the waters of baptism, follow Jesus, become a brand new creation filled with the Spirit, get regenerated. Open door, open invite. Or B, you are regenerated, but years, for years you have continued not to obey, but for years you have continued to disobey. And in doing so, you have quenched the Spirit of God. And the reason you don't feel God has nothing to do with God and everything to do with your continuous, ongoing, implacable disobedience rather than obedience. And you quenched God's spirit and you're numb and you're indifferent and you're cold and gosh, repent of your sin. Beg for mercy in fear and in trembling and rediscover the fear of God. But that's not the majority of you. The vast majority of you fall outside of both those brackets. You are regenerated. You have a new heart. You, how, how amazing is that? You have a brand new heart. And your deepest desire 
is to obey. Where does that come from? That comes from the spirit, Paul says, the energon, the energy at work in you to will. And then Paul goes on to say, next slide, to act in order to fulfill. Meaning, meaning God puts the desire in you and then God puts the power to follow through. And it's not empty, right, to God. No, God puts the power. You have the power deep inside your being, the exact same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's in your veins. You have the power to follow through and obey. And then Paul wraps it all up by saying, in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now that last phrase at the end of verse 13 can be translated, in order to fulfill his good purpose or your good pleasure all sorts of controversy about how to translate that end of that sentence. Is it God's good purpose or is it your good pleasure? Which one? Yes, Yes. (laughs) absolutely. Why pick a side? Both and, both are true. You need to understand and please listen that God's good purpose and your good pleasure are one and the same thing. Please wake up, get that, understand deep in your head and your heart right? God is after, obedience is about your good pleasure. God is after your joy. It's what's best for you. It's what's best for your body. It's what's best for your future. It's what's best for you. So many people think of God's commands as arbitrary, right? Kind of like the speed limit, (laughs) right? Out there somewhere is a dude or a dudette, and his or her job is to make speed limit. Should we make this road 35 or 45? I don't know, I'm in a 45 kind of mood today, you know? So many people think that way about God's commandments. Ah, you know, his take on sexuality, in marriage, outside of marriage, yeah, let's go with inside marriage, right? And I mean, you know how you think about the speed limit, right? (laughs) What's, there's a speed limit, right? Um, No, I mean, hey, as long as nobody's looking and as long as no harm is done, what's the big deal? That's how so many people think about God's commands. It's not right. You need to understand God's commands are not the speed limit on the road. God's commands are the road. Jesus flat out said that. My teachings, he said, are the hodos in Greek, or it gets translated as way or road. To what? To life. When you obey, you're not just staying on the road. You're staying on the road to life. When you disobey, you're not just breaking an arbitrary command. You're careening into disaster. Jeez, I love that idea that the reward for obedience is obedience. You are called to obey. It's for your good pleasure. And at the same time, obedience is about God's good purpose. Because God is after joy, not just for you. Yes, that, but God is after joy for the whole world. Now, I love... That is one of the many reasons you and I are called to obey, to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I love how Paul answers the why question. I love that about Paul, right? Always, nine times out of 10, he answers the why question. He never just says, hey, obey. Why? Because, (laughs) right? (laughs) That was what your dad said, but that's not what God said. I don't always have a good answer just because, right? Now, Paul always lays out reasons to be. There are four right here in today's text and last week's text. Right, four in one paragraph, okay? First off, if you're taking notes, Paul says, why obey? Well, because Jesus obeyed, right? Think back to last week. He was obedient to death. The whole point of the hymn from last week is that Jesus is the paradigm. If Jesus, Jesus obeyed, so should you. Jesus is not asking you to do anything he was not more than willing to do himself. Jesus obeyed. Secondly, Jesus is Yahweh. (laughs) Enough said. Jesus is, Jesus made the universe and he said, obey. Okay, right there. Case is closed. Three, there is a divine creative spiritual energy at work deep inside your being. Your deepest desire is to, all you have to do is tap in. And last, God's good pleasure, I'm sorry, God's good purpose and your good pleasure are one and the same thing. It's after your joy. In my opinion, that is more than enough reason to obey. Do you believe that? Do you? Yes or no? Do you believe that? I love how Paul writes to the Philippians and says, listen, 
You know what I love about you, Philippians? You obeyed when I was with you, when I was present, and now that I'm not anymore, now that I'm absent, you are still obeying. If Paul were to write you a letter, could he say that of you? You know, one of the things that I noticed from my vantage point about my generation, um, and I'm not, I know not all of you by any means are in my generation, but a bunch of you are, is that um, as far as stereotypes go, a bunch of you were not raised in the church, you're brand new to Jesus and church and all that, welcome to the family of God, get to work. Um, <laughs> but a bunch of you were, and a, a bunch of you, um, as a stereotype, were raised in very conservative Christian homes right on the edge of legalism, right? And you grew up in that, it's not all bad, um, but then you turned 18. You moved out on your own, you got a tattoo. It's in Hebrew, don't worry, you know. <laughs> uh, take that, Grandma, right? <laughs> Started to cuss a little bit on the side. Dude, it's missional, right? <laughs> you discovered beer. Oh, wow. Every other Instagram shot is you and your whatever, right? And you know what's going to happen? We're gonna play one massive generational game of ping pong. And the pendulum is going to swing. And I guarantee you, my son's generation, Jude, and all your kids that you have now or you're praying to have in the future are gonna grow up for the most part in very liberal Christian homes right on the edge of sin. And we're gonna play ping pong one generation after the next. Listen, the opposite of legalism is not liberalism, it's holiness. It's freedom to live in the shape of God intended. Immaturity is when you don't know how to handle freedom. It's when you're an idiot and you're stupid. Maturity is when you get a letter from Paul and it says, hey, listen, you're all grown up, you're out of the house, I'm not there anymore to enforce the rules, and you are still obeying more now than ever, well done. If Paul, yeah, if Paul were to write you a letter, could he say that of you?